Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, polymers. We're not going to go too much in detail because this has been covered in uh, materials one, but it is important that we do um, revise some of the uh, most important concepts regarding this uh, class of materials uh, with uh, an extremely high relevance in terms of industrial processes. So in terms of uh, the outline for today's lecture, we're gonna be talking about polymers in general. How can we classify them? We're gonna be looking uh, specifically at two classes of materials, thermoplastics and thermoset polymers. And they have very different uh, properties. And it's important that you know the differences between these materials and also how that uh, structure um, can then be relevant in terms of their manufacturing and uh, that transformation into tradable uh, products. Within the thermoplastics, we're going to look at this subclassification in terms of amorphous and crystalline polymers. What does this mean in terms of structure, but also in terms of function of these uh, materials? And then finally, we're going to go a bit more in detail uh, in terms of uh, the curing process or uh, the polymerization process that allows us to obtain uh, uh, thermosets uh, materials. So, as I've said at the beginning, uh, Friday you have your first summative assessment. It's a multiple choice question test. And I just wanted to go through uh, some of the important uh, aspects or uh, contents of the previous lectures that will be examined. Uh, this um, Friday. So in terms, and, and starting with additive manufacturing, it's very important that you know the classification of the different processes in terms of extrusion based, binder jetting, vat photopolymerization, and powder bed fusion. And then within these uh, different categories, it's uh, very important that you know exactly how fused deposition modeling works. So the working principle of each one of these systems is important. Uh, it's important also to know the different variations that you can have, for example, within uh, VAT photopolymerization in terms of how you can irradiate the polymers and transform them from liquid to solids. Uh, the different light sources that can be used and the specific advantages and limitations of each one of these uh, processes. Obviously, you don't need to know um, the exact commercial materials that are used uh, in FDM or SLA or binder jetting, but it's important they have an idea about the classes of materials. Like for example, in FDM, it's very common to use thermoplastic materials, or in other words, materials that we can melt and extrude and solidify to form three-dimensional objects. And in a similar way, it's important to know that in SLA, the type of material that I use to build three-dimensional objects in a layer-by-layer -layer fashion uh, are not commonly uh, termed as photopolymers. And that within the photopolymers family, we have, for example, acrylate based uh, resins. So <clears throat> the specific names of the commercial uh, materials available, it's not relevant, but the general classes of materials, it's important. Um, towards the end of the lectures on additive manufacturing, we've talked about the use of, of a cost model to estimate the different costs involved in the manufacturing of parts using additive manufacturing. Uh, so it is important that you know the different components of this cost model in terms, for example, of uh, the cost of the materials or, uh, for example, the costs involved with the fabrication of the components, which is normally associated with the build time. And I think as we've said <coughs> several times, <coughs> sorry, as we've said several times, uh, the cost model is quite generic. 
and it can uh, vary depending on the fabrication process that you use okay there are slight variations for example in terms of the costing uh, of the materials for powder bed fusion and the costing of the materials for fdm and for that purpose the formulas or the general formulas that we use to calculate the cost of the materials uh, involved in the fabrication of components with these processes it's also different and can change and that's why again it is relevant that you understand exactly how each additive manufacturing process works and what kind of materials are used with uh, these uh, processes uh, this is not strictly related with additive manufacturing but in one of the first lectures <clears throat> we talked about the general advantages of additive processes compared with subtractive processes and some of the most important developments in terms of uh, additive manufacturing or probably uh, more precisely in terms of um, computer integrated manufacturing and how that actually allowed us to actually develop these um, automated processes of fabrication also and again, this is not strictly related with additive manufacturing or casting or uh, injection molding or any other manufacturing process. But you as engineers need to know what are the different uh, areas of responsibility um, within a company. Uh, and this can uh, range from uh, more research focus to more planning of the operations and Again, you as engineers, and for this course, it's important that you know what is involved at each stage of uh, development of a product, okay? And this is uh, generally the things that you need to know for uh, additive manufacturing. In terms of uh, casting, uh, the, the, the topics that are going to be uh, uh, examined uh, this Friday, are related with the different casting processes and remember again that we focus only on three of the many casting processes available namely sand casting die casting and investment casting it's uh, important that you know the differences between these processes it's also uh, relevant for you to know what kind of defects can arise from metal casting both surface defects, as we've talked uh, about in one of the lectures, like blisters, but also internal defects that can arise uh, during the solidification or post solidification of the materials like porosity and the hot tears. It's not just about the defects, but also how can we prevent them or eliminate them, either by changing the design of our cassette parts or our molds, but also through the different process controls that we can put in place to mitigate uh, these defects or even to eliminate them. Okay, so please bear that in mind because that's an important aspect of casting. We've also uh, mentioned that the fluidity of a material or the flow of the material uh, during the cassette casting process is extremely important in terms of uh, the accuracy and uh, the, the, the mechanical performance of the parts that we fabricate. And understanding the different factors that can have, uh, influence the fluidity or how can we control somehow that fluidity is also quite relevant in order to obtain parts with optimal uh, structural and functional features. And obviously the casting process requires the use of molten metals, or uh, in this case, pure metals or uh, alloys. And the solidification process of these materials to generate parts, it's also quite relevant in terms of that functionality. So the different uh, parameters that can affect the solidification of these materials, and the different strategies that we can put in place to control that solidification uh, 
and their impact on the resultant uh, structure, structural and mechanical properties, it's also uh, extremely important. Like, for example, how the size of the grains can uh, reduce microporosity effects or can increase um, the mechanical properties or the strength of our parts. Uh, <clears throat> towards the end of the, the casting lectures, we've also discussed some design and economic uh, aspects. Uh, there are some general rules that we need to bear in mind when designing our molds, but probably more importantly, how can we design our parts? Um, and this was covered in the previous lecture, and you should also be uh, aware of uh, that. One important component or very important component in terms of uh, casting processes and probably more specifically to a sand casting process is uh, the filling, uh, the, the fill up process or the filling uh, process of the cavity of the mold. And we've looked at uh, two uh, theorems uh, like the Bernoulli and uh, the law of mass continuity. And how can we use them to uh, design uh, tapered sprues to avoid aspiration and the generation of defects? Remember that this uh, can be employed to design uh, sprues, but also it is very important that you know what are the general rules and uh, how can we design risers uh, to actually compensate for the shrinkage of the materials or uh, the contraction, the volumetric contraction of, of the materials during the solidification, okay? So these are uh, important things that you need to know on both additive manufacturing and casting, but towards the end of the lecture, if you've got any question, um, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to answer them, okay? And from now on until Friday, uh, if you've got any doubts, any questions regarding the content or the structure of the, of the quiz, please feel free to email me or to post them directly on the discussion board. Okay, so let's now effectively start with our lecture. Um, as you're probably quite uh, well familiar by now, uh, polymers, uh, or plastics are uh, a very, very important uh, class of materials used in our uh, industries. The word plastics comes from uh, the Greek plastikos, uh, which means to form or to mold or to shape. And the word polymer means many parts or units. And these parts or units are small molecules that are normally called uh, monomers. One of the classifications that we can apply to polymers is based on their origin. So polymers can be divided into synthetic or man-made uh, polymers. So these are materials that are developed in the lab based on synthetic components or natural polymers that we can obtain from uh, natural sources. Uh, and this is probably the most uh, broad classification of uh, plastics. As we were saying, uh, polymers are normally uh, quite large molecules uh, or macromolecules that are made by joining together thousands of small molecular units that uh, we term as monomers. The process by which we join these molecules is uh, called uh, polymerization. And this applies both to thermoplastics or thermosets. And then we'll see uh, later on during the lecture that uh, the way that we join these uh, monomers together, uh, the way that we form these two classes of materials, the thermoplastics and thermosets, it's quite different, but the general process is classified as polymerization. And the number of units or monomers that we use to form these large uh, molecular chains uh, determines the degree of polymerization. Or in other words, it's basically the number of these small monomers that we have in a single chain of your uh, material. The higher 
the number of monomers, the longer the chain, uh, the, the, the polymeric chain will become. And obviously, the higher will be the molecular weights of your polymer. And this has a very strong impact on uh, the physical and chemical properties of your materials. So on top of being divided into natural and synthetic polymers, uh, these materials can also be classified depending on uh, the monomers or the different monomers that we use to form these chains. So in the case that we use only one type of monomer uh, to form a long chain, then this polymer is going to be called a homopolymer. If instead you use uh, at least two different monomers and you organize them in blocks within your polymeric chain, then you will obtain a copolymer, um, a block copolymer. The same can happen with uh, uh, if you use two or more uh, monomers to form a, a polymer, but instead of having them organized in blocks, you have randomly organized or dispersed within the polymeric chain. So you can have one monomer A uh, followed by monomer B, then two units of monomer A, and then three of monomer B. And this can change as long as they are not organized in repetitive sequences of blocks. So this is another classification that can also be used to uh, define the type of material or polymer that you are using. This is just an example of some um, commercial polymers that are uh, available in the markets, like, for example, the polyethylene, where you have the repeating units of ethylene. The same happens with uh, the PVC, where you've got the vinyl chloride units um, uh, as your repeating unit uh, along uh, the polymeric chain. And the same in a very uh, common material or polymer uh, available in the, in the industry, like the polypropylene, where you've got uh, the propylene units being repeated uh, along uh, the polymer chain. So uh, normally when uh, you buy one of these materials, this uh, normally appears to you as uh, the monomer that is repeated throughout the, the polymeric chain. Um, and this is normally placed in front of the word polymer. The polymers are not just composed of uh, different types of monomers, but also you can change their properties, um, their physical properties, their chemical properties, uh, their mechanical properties, by introducing different additives uh, or re reinforcements uh, in, in, in the polymer. So we can, for example, use uh, fibers like carbon uh, to improve the mechanical properties of our material, so to increase the strength um, or to increase the flexural modulus. But we can also make materials that are normally not conductive when they're only composed of monomers by introducing conductive fillers like uh, aluminum powders or carbon fiber or even other uh, materials. And in a similar way, we can uh, introduce flame retardants. We can uh, also uh, reduce the material cost by introducing extender uh, fillers, or we can also improve uh, the melt flow properties, especially for example, for injection molding by introducing uh, plasticizers. And Depending on the application and the function of those polymers, we can also use different uh, pigments or dyes to um, introduce specific colors into our uh, materials. So obviously you don't need to know this uh, in detail, but it's just to make you aware that uh, normally the plastics that uh, we buy, or for example, um, some components or objects that we normally buy that are made of plastics, they don't contain only monomers, but they are made of different monomers and additives that provide the material with additional uh, functionalities. So another important classification in terms of the polymers 
it's uh, when we divide them into thermoplastics and thermosets. So thermoplastics, it's basically all types of polymers that we can melt, shape, solidify, and if needed, remelt again without degrading uh, the material. And the thermosets are all the materials that once they are solidified, they cannot be reformed, okay? So they don't have this ability to transition between different states uh, without being degraded. <clears throat> so for example, thermosets, if you uh, shape them or form them using heat, once they are reticulated, once they assemble, if uh, you provide heat again, you will not uh, melt them, but you will, you will actually degrade the material. The same doesn't apply to the thermoplastics, where obviously uh, if you uh, melt them, solidify them, and then remelt them again, providing uh, heat below the degradation temperature of the material, you can reuse them several times without degrading them. And it's because of this that this class of materials uh, account for almost 90% of uh, the market in terms of polymers. This doesn't mean that thermosets um, are less useful, but it's the fact that they are less flexible in terms of their manufacturing that makes the thermoplastics much more uh, attractive. Also, these materials uh, can then be further classified into uh, crystalline or amorphous materials. And this has basically to do with the structure uh, that are normally formed during the manufacturing process. So some important uh, considerations regarding uh, thermoplastic polymers in general, and at the room temperature, you will find that these materials are solid, but they become viscous liquids when you provide heat. So when you melt them, they will liquefy. Because of that ability, we can easily uh, transform them or manufacture them into different types of products. And we can reuse them several times, which makes the process uh, much more uh, sustainable as well. In terms of the structure of the polymeric chains, and this is a, a very big difference between thermoplastics and thermosets, Generally, what you will find in thermoplastic polymers is that they are composed of linear polymeric chains or uh, with uh, a few uh, branched structures, okay? If you increase the number of these branches, what this will make is that the resultant polymer or the part that you're going to fabricate using branched structures is going to become much stronger once solidified, uh, but also more viscous at a specific temperature uh, within the processing uh, of the material. So if you uh, provide the same temperature to a branched material and to a linear material, the branched material at the same temperature will be more viscous because of these branched structures, okay? So the other important uh, difference or uh, subdivisions that we can apply to thermoplastic materials uh, is regarded to the uh, crystalline structure. So it's important that you are aware that polymers are very rarely 100% crystalline because it is difficult for all uh, the regions within the polymer to become uh, fully aligned and compacted. So normally what you have is a semi-crystalline polymer where you have a percentage of the volume of the material where you have these regions with highly aligned polymeric chains, highly compacted. So a very high order of organization. And this is normally interdispersed by these less organized regions 
where the polymeric chains don't follow any particular orientation. Um, and this is normally the kind of polymer that you will find, semi-crystalline polymers. Obviously, the percentage of uh, crystallinity will change uh, from one polymer to another, even within the same class of materials. Okay, And this is normally uh, reflected then by the uh, properties that they will uh, display. In terms of uh, the crystalline structure of the materials, it's important that you also know or you are aware of some uh, concepts like the crystallinity. So the crystallinity refers to the degree of structural order in a solid, uh, in a solid and it's usually uh, specified as a percentage of the volume of the material that is uh, crystalline. The glass transition temperature is the temperature at which an amorphous solid becomes soft upon heating or brittle when you cool it down. And the glass transition temperature is lower than the melting point of its crystalline form in case it has one, okay? Because sometimes it might not have one. But in general, this Tg or uh, glass transition temperature is always lower than the melting point of its crystalline form. And the melting temperature is the temperature at which uh, a crystalline polymer <clears throat> changes its state from solid to liquid at atmospheric pressure, okay? So these are three important concepts that you need to know regarding uh, polymers. So I don't know about you, but I imagine that many of you have pets and in particular dogs. I do have quite a lot of dogs. And very often I go to the butcher to get some bones. And obviously if you bring a very large bone to your dog and if you give it to him, it's gonna be quite a tough job to actually uh, chew it. So I'm gonna just show you how, uh, for example, you can easily break a very large strong bone by controlling the crystalline structure of uh, the material. And although obviously this is not a polymer, this is a composite material, the same principle applies in terms of the structure of the bone. So what this example um, shows you is that obviously that bone at room temperature, it's really, really hard to break. But if you cool down that bone really fast, what you'll do is that you'll create a, a very fragile uh, structure by just changing the crystalline structure of your material. And this happens in uh, all sorts of materials. In at different levels, but 
if you normally cool down the material uh, very, very quickly, what you'll do is that you will not give time to the molecular chains to reorganize and compact um, with a very high order of organization. And by not allowing that, what you're doing is that you are making the material less strong. And that's um, what normally happens when you cool down the material very fast, not giving time for the formation of these crystalline regions that make the material much stronger. <clears throat> so in terms of the amorphous uh, polymers, there are some important characteristics that are really relevant for uh, different types of applications and that are uh, related with the uh, structural organization. So these are materials that are usually uh, transparent. And this property is related with the fact that the structure uh, of, of the materials, the, the, the structural organization of the molecular chains is very loose, is random. And this allows the light to be uh, transmitted. Also, when you process these materials, so uh, when you eat them up and then you cool them down to solidify, they have very uh, low uh, shrinkage. So in other words, on solidification, the random arrangements of uh, the molecules uh, produce very little volume change. And that's why you also have very uh, low shrinkage, which is a positive, a positive aspect uh, in terms of the processing of these materials. I think on the, on the downside is that these materials, because the, the structure is randomly organized, they also have very low chemical uh, resistance. And they are also, uh, or normally they display a very poor uh, fatigue and wear. So the mechanical properties are generally lower because of this random organization of their structures. But on the other hand, uh, crystalline polymers, they have a very well-defined uh, melting point because they have much more regions where the molecular chains are highly organized. They normally don't allow the light to be transmitted. And because of that, they are usually opaque, but they normally have a very high degree of shrinkage or uh, contraction. So as the material solidifies from the amorphous state, the polymers take up a closely packed, very well aligned structure. And this normally leads to a significant volume change that is uh, manifested as the as high shrinkage. On the good side, these materials have uh, much higher mechanical properties because as you can imagine, the higher the degree of organization, the more compacted the polymeric chains are, the more uh, mechanical resistance they will have. But not just mechanical resistance, also the chemical resistance will be higher when compared to uh, amorphous polymers. And these polymers, crystalline, uh, amorphous, uh, they have a wide range of applications in our industry. And the, there is a wide range of commercial polymers. Again, you don't need to know all these names in detail, but this is just to show you some of these uh, commercial polymers and the different types of applications from uh, film wraps to plastic bags, uh, bottles, water bottles, uh, pipes, flooring. So by manipulating the chemical composition in terms of the different monomers that we use to form the molecular chains, by adding different types of additives and fillers, and by controlling their structural organization, we can generate a wide range of polymeric materials with very different properties that can be used in a wide range of applications. In terms of uh, thermostat polymers, we've said at the beginning that they are quite different from uh, thermal uh, plastics. They are normally made from uh, polymeric resins that have uh, 
a particularly interesting aspect is that they are capable uh, of forming these chemical cross links or bonds. And this is unique to thermoset polymers. So it doesn't happen with thermoplastics. And because of that, these type of materials are normally uh, shaped uh, in, in molds and the chemical cross-linking process happens within uh, the molds. And this process of transforming these liquid materials into solids by chemically cross-linking the different polymeric chains is called curing process. The curing reaction is, as we've said again at the beginning, a polymerization process. But in this case, in different from thermoplastics, uh, it's characterized by a chemical cross-linking uh, number of reactions that creates an infusible, uh, almost insoluble, and highly cross-linked uh, three-dimensional structure, as you can see uh, here. And therefore, because of that, the Curie reactions of thermosetting resins differ substantially from uh, the polymerization process of thermoplastic materials, where you normally have linear or branched uh, structures. And they are normally linked between them, uh, in the case of thermoplastics, by weak uh, bonds. As you transform this material from liquid into solid, or from uh, liquid into this highly organized, dense three-dimensional network, what happens is that you have an increase in terms of the molecular weight, because you are joining the different monomers together. And also you have a transformation from a liquid resin into a solid, insoluble three-dimensional network. And this network, once formed, it cannot be reshaped. If you continue to provide energy, like for example, in the form of heat, what you'll do is to actually degrade the material, break these links and degrade the material. So just to uh, resume some of the main differences between thermostats and thermoplastics, thermoplastics always have weak straight chain bonds linking the uh, polymeric chains, and we can break them by providing heat. This allows us to actually shape the material, solidify it, and then remelt it again, as long as we don't go above the degradation temperature of the material. And this is specific to each type of thermoplastic. On the other hand, the thermosets, as we've just seen now, uh, the formation of these three-dimensional networks is promoted through very strong chemical bonds between the polymeric chains, okay? And these include cross-linking. And because of that, because these are, these are chemically cross-linked networks, we are not able to break them. And as a consequence, we're not able to reshape them once they are formed. Thermoplastics can be dissolved in organic solvents. And this is because of the very uh, weak uh, straight chain bonds that we have between the polymeric chains. In the case of thermosets, after the reticulation is completed, you're not able to dissolve them in organic solvents. Uh, as I've said before, if we uh, heat up a thermoplastic material once formed, we can soften them, we can reshape them, but we cannot do that in thermosets. The melting points or the point at which we uh, push the material from a solid state into a liquid state or a molten state, this point or this temperature <clears throat> is normally lower than the degradation temperature. But <clears throat> in the case of thermosets, that degradation point is lower than the melting point. Okay? And that's why we are not able to heat them without degrading. Okay? Finally, in terms of uh, their solid state, normally their structure, in the case of thermoplastics, consists, as we've seen before, in um, highly organized ordered regions that we call crystalline regions. And they are normally interdispersed by these less organized amorphous regions. And that's why we normally have semi-crystalline polymers and not 100% crystalline polymers. <clears throat> 
In the case of thermosets, uh, in the solid states, normally uh, that structure uh, or that polymeric structure consists of uh, this thermosetting resin uh, that it's normally interdispersed with uh, fibers that we use to reinforce uh, the material. Okay, so these are some important differences between thermosets and thermoplastics that you need to know. And this is normally what happens in terms of the polymerization of thermosets. So we normally start with a liquid resin. And just as an analogy, this is a type of reaction uh, that happens with materials in stereolithography. You have, uh, for example, a photopolymer uh, that is composed of monomers, photoinitiators, and potentially some additives. And as you provide energy, in this case, in the form of UV lights, what you'll do is that you will transform this liquid into a solid. And this goes through different stages. In the first stage of polymerization, what happens is that these monomers will react with the photo initiators and they will promote the cross-linking between uh, the monomers and between different chains of monomers that are formed. The first stage of polymerization is called uh, gelation. And at this stage, you have two phases. One phase that is completely cross-linked, chemically cross-linked, that is called the gel phase. And you have another phase that has not yet uh, reacted with photoinitiators, that has not yet reticulated, and is called the sol phase. The sol phase can still be removed at the gelation stage because it's not cross-linked. So we can use a solvent to remove this material that has not yet reacted, but the gel is insoluble, okay? So we cannot uh, break these bonds and um, reuse the material. If you continue to apply energy to this system, what you'll do is you'll force these monomers and photoinitiators that have not yet reacted, uh, and you will, uh, what you'll do is uh, to force them to react and to assemble into a three-dimensional solid uh, network where you have, in theory, all the monomers uh, reacting and forming uh, polymeric networks. This is not always the case. So you don't always obtain 100% uh, curing uh, reaction, or in other words, not all of the monomers will react and form a polymeric chain. There is always a small percentage of monomers that will not react and will then be removed. So again, making an analogy, and I know that during this pandemic, uh, a large number of people have been um, dedicating themselves to baking. Uh, and this is not very different from uh, baking. So you start with your um, ingredients, uh, flour, yeast, uh, you can add some sugar, you add eggs, you can have some more additives like chocolates, and chocolates is never enough. So more chocolates is added, you can add a bit of butter, and you add milk. And this is very similar to uh, the photopolymers that you use. You have your uh, grains that are normally your monomers. You had your photoinitiators, in this case is the yeast that will trigger that chemical reaction. And then you have different types of flexibilizers and additives um, into your uh, photopolymeric resin. In this case, your uh, cake. If you mix all of this together to form uh, a resin, if you provide heat, then what you obtain is, or what you promote, is the solidification of this liquid resin. And for you that have kids, uh, you'll always make a kid uh, happy. And I'm sure that many grown-ups as well. So as we've said before, there are two important uh, stages in terms of the curing reaction of thermosets. And it's important that you are aware of them. The first one 
is the gelation or the transformation of your liquid photoresin into a rubber uh, phase, okay, where you normally have two regions, uh, one that is the gel phase where all of your monomers have reacted and form a three-dimensional network and the remaining monomers that have not reacted that we call the sole uh, state. So this is the gelation and this is normally what happens um, at uh, the gelation process. At this point uh, where you have a two-phase structure, the system will no longer flow and these two phases will uh, coexist, okay? And remember that the gel phase or the gel part is insoluble uh, in non-degrading uh, solvents, but the sol phase can still be removed and degraded by uh, solvents. And as you move from this liquid stage to this um, gelation stage, you have a dramatic increase in terms of the viscosity, because obviously you are forming these uh, solid networks that will increase the viscosity of your system. In terms of uh, the vitrification, there are also some important aspects that you need to uh, know, or some important considerations. It normally occurs when the glass transition uh, temperature of the curing resin or the material that you're using or the photopolymer increases to the current curing temperature. So when your glass transition temperature uh, of your resin is increased to match the temperature at which you are promoting the reticulation of the material, then you will trigger the vitrification. The rates of this curing reaction is normally uh, reduced. So as you move from the gelation to the vitrification, the rate at which you promote the polymerization is reduced because obviously you have less monomers to react than you had at the beginning. And the final physical phase that you obtain depends on the temperature at which uh, the process is uh, uh, normally held. And as I've said before, this doesn't mean that you always obtain 100% uh, cured uh, material. Some of the monomers that you initially have in your resin will not react and will not form part of this three-dimensional network. <clears throat> so, as, 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 as I've mentioned briefly in the, in the beginning, Polymers are a very important class of materials uh, in terms of the different applications that we have in, in our industry. And it's important that we are aware of some of these um, aspects that make them so relevant to our manufacturing process, especially when we compare them with other uh, materials like metals or uh, ceramics. And one of the, 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 the important things or one of the important characteristics of polymers is that we can easily process them without the need of any post-processing stage after we shape them into a, a product. So plastics can uh, be formed by, for example, injection molding into very uh, complex part shapes. And after you do that, you don't have to do any post-processing as we normally have to do with metals, like for example, in sand casting, where we normally have to do some surface treatments to improve uh, the surface of our materials or to remove the runners from our uh, casted parts. They are also quite uh, competitive from an economical point of view. And on a volumetric basis, plastics are much more attractive from an econ economic point of view when compared to uh, metals. And that's why they are so widely used. Also, they generally require less energy uh, to produce them uh, when compared to metals. And a very simple uh, uh, comparison is, for example, uh, in powder bed fusion. If you use a polymer that has a much lower melting point, you need or you require less energy to melt it and solidify it than if you have to 
uh, melts uh, metal or alloy that has a much higher melting point. The level of energy consumption is much higher and therefore the overall cost is also much higher. They also have benefits depending obviously if they are um, amorphous or crystalline or depending on the percentage of crystallinity that you have, which is the, which are these optical properties. Many of the polymers that we use are transparent and this doesn't happen with metals. And because of that, we can use them in much more applications than we can use metals or ceramics. Also, uh, they are low density materials that generally display quite good mechanical properties. Uh, and also, as we've seen before, can have a very good chemical resistance. And if we use uh, different types of fillers or additives, we can change also their electrical conductivity and apply them in different situations where uh, previously could not be applied if they were composed simply of uh, monomers. So these are some uh, general benefits of polymers <clears throat> when compared to metals. And as I've said before, the idea of this lecture was mainly to revise some important concepts regarding uh, polymers and uh, the different classes of polymers. Uh, because in the next lectures, we're going to be talking about how can we use these materials in injection molding to build uh, tradable products. And much of those, uh, much of that manufacturing process is uh, normally defined by the properties of these materials. So just to summarize, uh, we've looked at how polymers are formed. Uh, also, we've looked at the classification in terms of polymers from a broad classification uh, in natural or synthetic materials. But probably more importantly, we've looked how can we classify them according to their structures, okay? Thermoplastic materials, thermoset materials, they are very different from a polymerization point of view, and that has an impact in terms of their properties as, as well. Although thermoplastics account for almost 90% of uh, the market in terms of plastics, because obviously of their ability to be uh, melted and reshaped without uh, degrading, thermosets are also a, a very important class of materials. They have uh, they are quite different from thermoplastics in terms of the polymerization process. And the polymerization process of thermosets is normally termed as cross-linking, okay? And this is basically the establishment of these chemical bonds between the polymeric chains that make these materials insoluble um, in organic solvents and also do not allow us to reprocess them once they are uh, formed, once these three-dimensional networks are formed. Remember about the two main events that occur during the uh, polymerization of these materials, namely the gelation and uh, the vitrification, okay? And this brings us to the end of our uh, lecture. Uh, next week, we're gonna start talking about uh, the manufacturing of these materials, or the use of these materials in different manufacturing applications. And um, I'm now happy to answer any questions you have.